Hi, I'm Peter Lord. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. Peter Lord, welcome to the Sarah O'Connell Show. How are you today? I'm fine. I'm very good. Yeah. Good. Fantastic. Now, we once met in the year 2000 at the Annecy Animation Festival when I was still a student. Do you still go to that festival? I would love, to. I would go. Yeah, I have. I went last year and would have been going in June, but but not. Yeah, yeah. It's still a, still an amazing festival. Uh, you know, the whole world is there. The world of animation is there. It really is. Now, you studied English at York University. Were you already interested in animation at that point? Had you been experimenting with it at all? Yes, I mean, um, it was a hobby um, bef before university. So when I was still at school, um, I'm, I'm from Bristol, but, but circumstances had swept me around the world and I'd ended up in Surrey and uh, I met a bloke, Dave Sproxton, and we started animating together as a hobby, a fun thing to do, um, which was sound, you know, which wasn't usual then, wasn't normal, wasn't normal behavior. Uh, and we, but we did. And so, and, but then we didn't think that it would be a career because why would you? It's such a strange thing to do. We, so we didn't really imagine that. And um, we went off to different universities to do different things. And when we went, when we left to go to university, did we think we'd meet up again at the end? I don't think we did really. But as it turned out, that friendship was the one that endured through, all, through everything else. And so, we, so, so when we graduated with, our, with my useful degree in English and Dave's useful degree in geography, which is great for animation. Um, uh, you can speak to each other and find each other, which is good. <laughs> two good things, exactly. exactly. Yeah, yeah, we couldn't, uh, and uh, yeah, so, so in all that, we were kind of self-taught with animation. Oh, wow, and so in the early days when it was just the two of you, how did you sort of divide things up? Did you both animate or did one do that and one did the sets and the lighting and stuff? How did it work? Yes, so there were the two of us and I was the, I was the arts, one and Dave was the, um, I was going to say scientific, that's not quite the word, but the, the technical one and, and the practical one. And that would prove to be a very strong partnership. So I did the animation and I made most of the models in the early days. Uh, we would write the stories together and then Dave would do the lighting and make sure the camera worked and uh, do the VAT returns and you know, everything else, everything else. And you know, I, I, I often think how how useful that was that partnership. You know, such a valuable thing. Uh, and when people say to me, you know, eager students say, you know, how do I make a career? I'm inclined to say it's great to have a partner. I mean, it's not, you know, you, you can't you can't invent one, I guess. But it's so, it's so it's so useful to have to share out the skills. In 1972, there was a, a series called Vision on with Tony Hart, and he had, a, it wasn't claymation, it was a traditionally drawn yeah. character called Aardman, who yeah. I understand the name is half Aardvark and half, well, like Superman or something. Yes, that's all there is to it, yes, that was it. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it, it was, I, you can't really call it a joke, because it, it's not a joke, but it seemed funny when we were, 17. You know, like Ard, Ardvark seemed like a funny animal. Um, and Ard Man was, um, in theory, a failed superhero. I mean, he was so failed that he never did anything heroic at all, I don't think. You know, he, um, he was just a character in a strange costume who had adventures. And, we, and it was all drawn animation, very old school. Um, took a long time to do and, and was and it was difficult and it never flowed you know it was, it was never easy never easy or natural because we weren't trained I think and then um, so uh, but 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 on the other hand we did sell a story with our men to this vision on program and, um, and it, it wasn't it was badly animated and technically rubbish but the story was kind of okay. It was good. And, um, and then we sold it to the BBC, and the BBC said, who should we write the check out to? Those, those are the days. Um, 
And so we chose Ardman as a company name back then, back in, it must have been 71 or something, ages, ages ago, yeah. we chose that name. And it didn't mean anything. And, 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 and sometimes over the years, we thought of changing it. Like we'd think, this is a, this is a foolish name. You know, we thought of changing it. Um, uh, but we never, quite, we never quite got around to it. And now it seems like a good name. You know, it seems a strong name. Absolutely. Are you ever tempted to revisit that character that kind of gave you that name and bringing him into the 21st century? Superhero is very popular these days. True. Are you ever curious to know what he'd look like in plasticine? Yeah. It, ha it has been suggested. It has been uh, by other people, actually. Not <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's funny. I've, I have a great, you know, sentimental attachment, but I don't know anything about the character at all. Maybe that's good. Maybe it's... Maybe that's a blank sheet, you know, you can invent, like if we were, yeah, you could totally invent an entirely new character, like the way that Marvel do sometimes, they take their ah. character and completely reinvent them. We could do that with him, mm -hmm. keep the name, ch change everything else. Yeah. I've watched that. Yeah. Having started off doing 2D animation and you managed to get it on TV, what then drew you to trying 3D? What drew me was, was seeing somebody else doing it, which I think is, is a good thing to say. Um, there was a, yeah, on TV one day, we saw a little glimpse of something that was, was quite obviously um, modeling clay being animated. It couldn't be more obvious because you could see all the fingerprints and it was very, it was just like very roughly done, roughly sh shaped models of monsters and trees and things. Uh, like a monster eating a tree, monster, monster eating another monster. No story at all. And we saw this thing and thought, oh, that's a good idea. We'll copy that idea. And, and that's kind of it, really. That's, that's you know, um, and it's amazing to think now, young people won't, young people won't understand this, but in the old days, when you saw something on TV, you could never see it again because it wasn't, there was no internet. There was no, God knows, there was no, um, there was no VHS tape, you know, like um, things just whizzed by and there were no repeats. Mm. So we saw this thing once for, for, I think, a couple of minutes. And, but that was just the spark of inspiration. And, um, and in later years, I tried to find what that film was and eventually found it. Oh, wow. And it was made by an American called Eli Noyes. Um, and it was in black and white, and it looked like it was prehistoric. And so I assumed that Eli Noyes was dead. And then I, w I was showing, I was giving a talk in San Francisco five years ago. And um, this bloke came up to me afterwards, and it was indeed the, the Eli Noyes, the man who invented um, the, the original film. So that That's was amazing. Great. It was nice. Lovely to meet him. Yeah. yeah. And so you'd established kind of a, a bit of a relationship with BBC and Tony Hart. Yeah. How did you come up with the character of Morph? And then not only that, having become Tony Hart's sidekick can be so intrinsic to everything yeah. you do thereafter. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? We, I mean, we, it, I guess we were asked to. We, we'd invented some characters um, that they called, the BBC, uh, the producer, called the Glebees. And they were a little bit smaller than Morph. And there were like four of them, I think, and multicolored. And they, we had them playing around on a desk, on, the, on an artist's desk, on Tony Hart's desk, I suppose. And they were, they were mischief makers. They knocked over pots of paint and so on. And um, the producer said, that's a good idea, do that again. And so we started to do it again and we chose, um, we didn't have four of them, we just had one or originally one to start with anyway. And we chose his color, which is um, terracotta. We chose it because it was the best plasticine. That sounds a straight, yeah. Uh, it was strong and the colors didn't come off on your hands too bad. And uh, in his first appearance, he's, he's just annoying. He, he annoys Tony Hart. Uh, and Tony is very cross with him, and he picks him up and, and he slams him, throws him in his box and slams the lid and says, you know, 
that's quite enough of that kind of thing. Uh, so it was, it was tough to start with, and they became friends later. And the, the truth is that we, we had the great luxury of developing the character over the course of, especially the first series, yeah. uh, and gradually finding out what worked. So when you look at some of the early ones, they're terrible. I mean, the early morph stories, I mean, badly animated and very bad stories. So, some of them, like, like, or awkward, awkward stories. Um, strange, weird things happen that are not very well. But gradually, it, thanks to you know, Tony reacting and with the, with the advice of the production team, it became more like a proper nice relationship, you know, enjoyable, nice, satisfying relationship. Uh, and I feel very warmly towards the whole thing. You know, Tony was a lovely guy, lovely, lovely mm. man. Um, you know, great, terrific artist and so easy to work with and so helpful and so on. Um, and Morph, uh, Morph, he's probably here. <laughs> And he's, he's, always, he's, never far, he's never far away. Um, and uh, yeah, he, he became a character. He, like, and I always say, like, like, like how, do you, how do you create a character? Designing the character is one thing, but designing the personality is really hard. Yeah. And, what, and it's really, they're defined by by what they do. So Morph is the, you know, that's how he got, now he got, that's how he got his character, by being a bit pompous, a bit pleased with himself, you know, um, slightly, I'm um, sort of a, a little bit sort of small C conservative, I think, <laughs> in his early days. And, 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 the, and the gradually that became really nice. And, and then, and then one day he was make a sign of his vanity. He was making a statue of himself. Terrible. Terrible vanity there, and um, so he made a, a statue of himself, which was kind of in, in stone color and um, had kind of rough edges, rough like it had been badly carved. Uh, and that statue came to life in a conventional, uh, in a good old surrealist way. And then that, and then that became Chaz after a few, after a few appearances, and then, and then a double act was born. Fantastic, because of course Morph, and oh by the way, I also have Morph by my side at all times too, genuinely, because I'm very good. <laughs> and I genuinely, when I'm working on my show, this is always next to me. Very good. Especially with the drink. I, I haven't got one of those. I mean, I had, I've seen them before, but I haven't got one. Oh, that's terrible. I mean, good. <laughs> good I recommended. <laughs> I've had it for about a decade now, I think. Yeah, it's quite a funny idea, isn't it? It's a good idea. A good I think so. Yeah. Well, it's tough on Morph, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is a bit. He, he seems not best pleased about it. <laughs> it's quite. Mm. I don't blame him. So, of course, Morph went on to have his own TV show with Chaz and all the other characters. Mm. How quickly can you make Morph now? If you just have, if you had some plasticine, what's yeah. the construction process like? If there's a bit of an accident. Yeah, it's about. It takes me about twenty minutes, I think. You know. Um, and God knows I've done it often enough. Um, so it's fairly instinctive. The, it's amazing how it is affected by the temperature. It's amazing the difference it makes. Um, mm. uh, and this chap I'm holding in my hands now is distinctly cold. Yeah. Uh, and when he's cold, you've got to be very careful with him because if you, if you bend him when he's cold, then he'll kind of, then he breaks, which is a terrible thing, a terrible thing. Um, so I've, I've done, I've, Built it many, many times, um, and oh, it's funny actually because I built him so many times. The fact is, he does it, he does change. If you look back at photographs over yeah. forty years, he he does change. Um, and, I yeah, suppose we all do. We all do. <laughs> he's, he's More friends than us, and yeah, he's, <laughs> he's generally got tends to get a bit a bit younger, which is. You know, which is lucky for him, God knows. Um, but um, yeah, he, he changes because it's not it's not very accurate. And then, and one year, like about twenty years ago, we thought what we should do is we should 
make a mold so we can mass produce it from a mold. Uh, and we tried and dismally failed because because I had no skill at model making. And and I concluded it wasn't possible. I thought that no, you can't you can't make a plasticine puppet that you can then animate. You can't make it mold. It won't work. But but smarter younger people than I have worked out how to do it. So so there is a machine to make a mold. Oh wow! But I would obviously never use it ever. That no, no. But other but others I let others do it. And I always struggled to, when I was Do playing I? with plasticine or whatever, just to get things to stand up. Now, I know that later films and stuff have these sort of skeletal armatures inside them. Did Morph no. have that or not? No, he doesn't. That, that, that's the joy of it. It's the joy of it. It's true. No, he, he has nothing. So so he's just plasticine. You know, so that, um, and so I, so I can, you know, I can make one. If I make one um, while I'm doing a talk or something like that, I can say with hand on heart that, they, that you know, it's about you know, 60 p's worth of plasticine, mm. uh, and you can make a perfectly good animation puppet, which which is true. Um, it's quite difficult to animate him because, he, like you say, because he hasn't got a skeleton inside, so um, he can just fall over the whole time. Yeah. Um, so so in the old, I can't believe it now. That I did so many episodes. I mean, hundreds of episodes. <laughs> And it was like a balancing act, really. As much as, as much as an animation act, it was balancing. It was, the, the great trick was to stop him falling over. You know. Um, now I can also reveal that in the uh, the digital age, people cheat, and and um, animators cheat. And uh, now you can support him with um with with a, a, a rig, um, and then digitally paint the rig out afterwards. So it's. Life's, life's got so easy now. <laughs> so he looks younger, but he now has like support to stand up. <laughs> That's interesting. Isn't it? Interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yes. Yes. He has all, all kinds of artificial aids now. Now, I also I have an amazing book, The Art of Ardman, which is behind me there actually, which has these amazing, I guess, scans of an old sketchbook of yours from about 1980, which has got lots of sketches and doodles of more yeah. and storyboards and all that kind of thing. Do you still like to draw a lot? Yeah, I like that. I like that doodling a lot, yes. And and um and I it's a very interesting way to find to get stories, actually. He says, I have, one, I have one right here. I have one right here. So, now I can't find it. I mean, yeah. oh, so that's, that's, this is kind of now. And there's, here's Morph, for some reason, trying to break into his box. I don't know why that is. And here's some gags with Morph and the, and the mobile phone. So, so you, what happens is you, I find that when you you draw and doodle around a story, it it you actually get story ideas out of it. You know, like you do, you sit down, you start drawing more for the mobile phone, and and jokes emerge, and and um and whole stories emerge. It's, it's a really interesting process. You know, where, whereas without drawing, for me, it's like it's very cold. No, not cold, but slightly. Yeah, uh, can't look at a slightly cold, pro a slightly cold <laughs> process. To, sort of to detached, down. I guess, from the character. Yes, detached. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Just think in terms of in terms of words and ideas is difficult, but as soon as you render them as drawings, I find it it gets e easy for me. Yeah, and it's fun. I like it very much. Yeah, yeah. I always think, um, and I'm always very careless, and I'm pleased. That I'm careless about. The, the books that I draw in, and I always draw on every page, so then one drawing shines through from the one on the other side, and um, I never finish anything. And so it's it's a real working t tool, you know, for for, th for ideas. Um, and I'm always annoyed that that they don't look so good when they're published because I think I think I'd, I'd like them. I'd like to, someone to publish my my sketchbooks. Yes. And also, because they have they have useful telephone numbers in and uh, <laughs> and, and stuff like that. shopping lists and stuff like that. Shopping lists, yeah. Occasional abusive remarks about other people, you know. Like. 
Yeah. Now, in the 1980s, you also worked on quite a few music videos. Peter Gabriel, Nina Simone. Did you actually work with the artists closely when you were doing their music videos? How how did that collaboration happen? Yeah, with with Nina Simone, we had no collaboration at all. It was a funny project. I mean, I, I love it. I'm very proud of it. Um, My Baby Just Cares For Me is such a great song. Well, I can't remember. I'm very bad on detail, but, but in broad strokes, we were... We were making a lot of money at that time from doing TV commercials. So we had, we had spare cash. And we approached, I think we approached a record company and said, we want to do a video for one of your songs. It was that way around, I think, which is unusual. I mean, uh, and, and a back catalogue number. My Baby Just Cares For Me was on their back catalogue. Um, so... Um, we approached them, and they said, oh, yeah, great, great, yes, fun. why not? Uh, and I have no idea what money changed hands. I have no idea whether it was a, whether it's a financial project or not. I don't know, a commercial success or not. But we did it um, with no, with no <laughs> frankly, with no reference to anybody. We just did what we wanted, and that was it. Those were the, those were the days. You know. <laughs> um, and Peter Gable was utterly different because... Um, they, his company contacted us and he was working with a company, I think it was called Limelight, I think. And um, in that case, Peter um, kind of had the, he had the idea, he's such an interesting man, really delightful fellow. He had the idea and he had a, a director. So there was a, a, a very eccentric, <laughs> very eccentric American called Stephen Johnson. Was, was the director so basically um this company limelight uh, arranged a a uh, arranged marriage with with peter gabriel stephen johnson and us to do this thing uh in in record-breaking time you know and um that was fun it was that was great fun it was the the big idea is kind of um Hard, slightly hard to explain now. It was made in 86, and in the 80s, uh, people in advertising, and in, in advertising particularly, and in music videos, had got very excited by new technology, by digital technology, and the fact that you could create computer images, and the fact that you could easily superimpose images, um, and, you know, very simple, obvious stuff you take take someone against a green screen and put them in some other environment and then duplicate them many times, all kinds of stuff. Um, but so it was very, it became a very digital medium. And um, this guy, Stephen Johnson, the director, approached us and he said, I, I don't want any of that. I want it all done, like for real, handmade, so that, um, so that everything you saw on the screen you would have seen if you looked through the camera, uh, which is not the case in most. It's not the case in most, especially these days in movies. You know where where everything's done on green screen and with computers. So, um, so Stephen wants us to do it that way, handmade, and that that you know what we love too. And so they came to us, uh, and we brought in some two very wacky fellows called the Quay Brothers, who are also are very very good animators. Uh, and with their inspiration, we just did a bit of everything. We did it very fast. It was like, I think it was about six days, which is oh, quite wow. amazing. Mm. And Peter was in there the whole time, and he was amazing. He was a real, a real trooper, you know, because he was working. He was in front of the camera the whole time being, you know, manipulated, basically shoved around, treated like an animation puppet, actually, his face painted and so on. Um, and, uh, and so by, by going back to, to basics, we ended up with something that, that seemed incredibly new. And, and, the, and it was a style that everyone then copied for three or four years. You know, everyone tried to copy that, that funny ha handmade, that old fashioned look, but no, no, modern look, but done in a very, very traditional way.
And so you must have at the time had a lot of students contacting you and seeing a lot of other people's work. What made Nick Park's The Grand Day Out stand out to you? Yeah, we, I guess we didn't know many people at that time. Actually, we, there was a period after Morph, around about the Morph series, when um, it seemed like we were the only people doing what this thing, this strange thing that we did, this animating with plasticine, seemed like our special thing. And then one day we were invited to the National Film School, which is just outside London. Um, and we were invited by Nick, as it turned out. So he was a student there. And he was kind of on his own, as we'd been kind of our, on our own, um, in a, working in the, working everything out for yourself, you know, self-taught, um, with no one to go to to ask technical questions and so on. So we were invited to, to for a day to come and help him and give advice and meet the other students, which was all very good. So we did that. We met this young man we didn't know at all. Uh, and he was working on this film that, that would become a grand day out. And it was kind of, yeah, it's quite easy, really. I mean, we we just saw we just saw he was really good, mm. like, very early, yeah, immediately. But but I, I always say we never knew how good because he is. Let's face it. Let's face it. He's a genius. Is what he is. Um, we didn't know that straight away, but we thought he was bloody good. He, I, I always remember that he. It was very early in the Grand Day Out, and. Um, Wallace was trying to design the rocket. He's sitting at his, at his work desk. He's got a great big pencil in his hand and he draws a rocket and then he, he looks at it and he's, he rubs his chin and looks thoughtful and he scrumbles it up and throws it away and does another drawing. And it wasn't like, it wasn't particularly genius comedy. It wasn't even especially genius animation, but it was, it was expressive character stuff you know he so by by the way he was moving and by the the look on his face you knew exactly what he was thinking and that sounds really obvious perhaps now but it wasn't very obvious back in the day and so it was that that i liked i think and then I, at some stage i think it was probably our first meeting he showed us a shot he'd done i think maybe the very first one where wallace says we forgot the crackers. And what Nick had done is he's, he animated it with a, a fairly conventional um, mouth shapes, like quite sort of, quite minimal. Mm. Like the mouth, his mouth wasn't moving very much. And it wasn't, it was, it was okay, it was fine, but it wasn't very interesting. And he knew that it wasn't good enough. And he did another, had another go, and in the second go, he, he started this ridiculous, exaggerated mouth shape that, that Wallace is famous for, this big coat hanging on mouth. And um, he did that, and that was hilarious. And same line of dialogue, same, same words exactly. The one version was okay, the other version was hilarious. And, and that's, that's his great skill. He, he, he just knew what was funny and what wasn't funny, um, which sounds, you know, it's a real, it's a real skill, you know, and, and he, had, he had the sort of energy to, to chase down the funny thing. And um, yes, yeah, so, so then, then eventually, having met him, having seen how good he was, uh, we invited him to come and join us. And he joined us to finish the film because he was working very slowly. He was working so slowly, it would have taken him about 20 years to finish, I think. We invited him to join us in Bristol, and he came as an animator, and you could say, you know, politely, that he was kind of a bit of a dog's body for, for a, a few months. You know, he just did the jobs that nobody else wanted to do, you know. Um, and, then, um, and then very quickly he became a superstar, and so there was... Uh, so, so then uh, he was no, no longer the uh, studio dog's body, but the studio superstar. 
Fantastic. And there's been quite a few Wallace and Gromit adventures, of course, now. Do you have a favourite? I, I do love the, the Wrong Trousers. I mean, the Wrong Trousers is superb, I think, actually. Mm, I agree. No, actually. I mean, I, I also greatly love the, the Wear Rabbit as well. I love the Wrong Trousers for its extreme elegance and simplicity, you know, and nice storytelling, a good, tight storytelling. Mm. Good, tight storytelling. Great jokes. Uh, and some superb set pieces in there, notably the train chase, which is just, I mean, the train chase is often referred to by, you know, quite serious people in the film business as an example of, you know, a perfect example of action movie making. Absolutely. Which is, uh, The Curse of the Rare Rabbit is, is kind of different, but it's, it's so zany. It's got so, it's got so many funny, big funny ideas in it. I have to, I'm a big fan of that too. Yeah, because there's loads of, of course, sight gags as there are in every cartoon, but also just the script is so good as well. And yeah. there's lines yeah. like stop arsing about with the arsing conversation that yeah. just made me yeah. laugh every time I think about it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yes. And there's, and there's some there's some gag, you know, I can't think how it goes about the vegetables. Some, oh, no, sorry, it's completely, it's completely lost me. <laughs> it's in the same. It's in the same scene, and and I don't know. And Lady Tottenham says says something about uh, the vegetables will be safe at last or something. And Victor, the bad guy, looks at, looks at all the villagers and thinks they thinks they're vegetables. Sorry, I I can't tell the joke, so I should shut up. One question I must ask you is: if if Morph existed in the same world as Wallace and Gromit, yeah, would Wallace tower over Morph in the same way that humans do? That is such a difficult question, isn't it? Um, it's, it's so interesting because occasionally they appear together in photographs. And you're right, they, they do come from different worlds, don't they? Mm. I think it would be better if well, this towered over Morph in the same way. It'd be very difficult to animate because you have to make, because Morph would have to be tiny, wouldn't he? Be, yeah. Yeah. I, I, sp I suppose you could blue screen it and have them work screen. with them the same size and then scale yeah. morph down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or Wallace up. Yes, whichever. Either, yeah. So again, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but um, yes, we have, it's funny we've never done it actually because it's, it seems kind of obvious, doesn't it, to actually put them on the screen together yeah. one day. One so day. I wonder if, like, if Wallace and Gromit, like if Morph exists on TV in Wallace and Gromit's world, like if that would be a character for them or if they would exist in the same universe. Yeah, in a way they don't, but 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 Marvel get away with it. They they, they, they squishy the verses together. <laughs> because, because I was like, it, it, I don't know what would happen. You know, if if Wallace and Gromit were walking around like on Morph's desk, that would be very strange. Hmm. Not because the, then they they'd be a little bit, bit taller than him, and and like you know, Wallace could completely lean on the on a on a mug or something like that, that would be very, that would be quite surreal. I'm always amused by, by Wallace and Gromit, by the way, mm. like the, the logic of the world is, is so wonderfully weird because um, like Wallace and Gromit are, are, are made of living clay, aren't they? Look at that, you can see the fingerprints, it's clearly plasticine. Yeah. And yet the rest of the world is, is made of wood and metal and paint and, and stuff like that. And I never quite know how those two things fit together. And what and what is his hands are so big. You know, if they were scaled up, if I if I if my hands were as big as Wallace's hands, it'd be like like enormous dinner plates at the end of my arms. Enormous dinner plates, you know. And then, and it's very funny when he, his gigantic hand picks up something that's quite small, like a like a mug or something. Yeah. I, I always wonder if I don't always wonder if I have wondered. <laughs> but I'm not constantly locked in a state of wonderment <laughs> about this one thing. But like, because of course you can see the fingerprints on them and stuff. Are they yeah. aware of them? And if so, it'd be interesting to see them reference that at some point. Yes. Like, yeah. how do they explain that to themselves? Yeah, I know that's good. I, do you know? It's funny you say that because there is, there is a story I want to do. I want to do it with Morph actually, whereby whereby Morph encounters plasticine that isn't alive. We've never quite done it. And I just think it's very interesting, like, whether he would recognise that this is, 
they are the same material, but one of them, but one of them is alive, the other dead. Yeah, and all, and all. I see. I saw a film once by somebody else, and I don't know what the hell it was. It, it was sort of a film noirish kind of thing done with puppet animation, and um, the gag was that the, it was it was set in a, in a street set, and then one of the, one of the walls fell down, and the character found he stepped behind it. And then he realized he was on an animation set. He realized he, he, realized he was tiny and he found a, a block of plasticine. And he squidged it with his hand, squeezed it like an expression of like, you know, disbelief and disgust as he discovered, you know, like discovering, I don't know, the raw material of life, you know, lurking around. Sorry, it's dead. serious stuff. There's a, it's serious stuff. There's a funny film in there somewhere. Yeah, I'd love to see that. I mean, I have a similar sort of recognition experience. I'm in a supermarket and I just see bags of potatoes. I'm like, that is me. That's how I exist. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know why you feel that, Sarah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably because of the amount of crisps I eat. It's got something to do with it. <laughs> Fair enough. They're intrinsically part of my DNA at this point. Okay, okay. Although, ironically, I'm not much of a walker, so I don't know what the connection is. <laughs> You're a, and they're not a smith, no. I, exactly. Yeah. Now, <laughs> there was, going back a bit further, there was a, a BBC animated conversation series where you would record real life conversations. Was yeah. that kind of the, the precursor to Creature Comforts? Yeah, yeah, it was, yes, yeah. Um, again, again, it was someone else's idea, and I'm, I'm very happy to say that, you know, like most ideas aren't aren't created they're adapted from somewhere else so someone else suggested it to us and when, when it was suggested it just seemed like the most impossible challenge the idea was the, that you would um make a recording that was like documentary recording i.e not scripted and then you would animate to bring it to life uh, and and when this idea came up like we didn't even we didn't even know why it was a good idea. All we knew was there was some money attached to it. Yeah, so that was the main thing. Um, and so that was a good idea and we had no money. But we didn't, but you know, taking a documentary soundtrack and live act and animation together, it's, it was a strange mix. Anyway, um, the guy who brought the idea to us was a, a, a BBC um, producer called Colin Thomas. Very nice man and really, really, influential on us he suggested the idea and he helped us to take a sound recorder down to a salvation army hostel in uh, broad weir and uh and we so we had a, a sound recorder there and the whole point was not to interfere was was to eavesdrop on life but not to affect it at all so we we, we hit a microphone somewhere and waited, and kind of nothing happened for three hours, nothing interesting at all. And then there was, a, there was an interesting conversation between a man coming in who wanted something, uh, a meal, I think, and the guy behind the desk. And there was a, it was a conversation of misunderstanding, basically, but it was, it was interesting. And because they were talking to each other and not quite understanding each other, uh, and it was incredibly real sounding, because it was real. And... Uh, and and in the to cut a long story short, we ended up animating to match it. I mean, so we made a short film called Down and Out, which looks a bit, you know, has a faintly documentary look, except all the characters made of plasticine, and they just acted out this story. And like, why was that a good idea? I don't know. Except it was, except it had, it had humanity in it. You know, it was it was sympathetic to the guy that, that was confused. It had a sort of a bit of drama to it, and simply seeing these characters made out of plasticine talking was a very surprising thing. You know, um, was yeah, um, and yes, you're right. That I so we made that film. Uh, the BBC paid for it. God bless them. And it was great, uh, but it didn't make much impact because well, it's a five minute film that sits in the middle of nowhere, you know, it didn't, didn't make much impact. Um, but it, it, it 
in due course, it unlocked something else, which was um, Channel 4. When Channel 4 started, uh, they suddenly, they were ready to buy animation, which nobody else had ever been before. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, yeah, so, so Channel 4 approaches. Um, have you got any ideas? And we showed them our film. And they said, oh, yeah, do that. Do that again. Do, do 10 more like that. Which was you know, great, amazing, amazing. That's what, uh, um, amazing. Uh, we, uh, we we didn't in the end. We did five, but still, it was a great thing, and um, and that led on to creature comforts. So we tried this thing, this documentary thing, and the documentary thing was really hard to do. If you're not professionals, which we're not, it's hard to get the sound right. Uh, so we didn't get much very interesting stuff. We were working with really quite boring conversations actually and trying to make them funny somehow uh and then nick came along later and he had a simple idea i don't know why we never thought of it and his idea was to take people talking about their own real lives but then just to transpose that into the mouths of animals talk about their lives and it was great wasn't it i mean another brilliant nick park idea <laughs> and then, of course, in 1991, Creature Comforts won Best Animated Short Film. How Indeed. did the studio react to that? <laughs> well, we were very happy, I can tell you. Yes. <laughs> we were very happy. It, I, you know, I mean, Dave and I and Nick went out to um, Hollywood and attended the Oscars and, you know, it was, that was astonishing, you know. Just so, so interesting and amazing. I was wearing a you know, my finest um, Oxfam tuxedo, you know, and, um, and, and it, it, was, it was amazing. We were working at that time out of a shed in um, um, Clifton, near the student, student Union building, just a big old shed. Uh, and our lives were very nice and very, very normal and very Bristol and we would, you know, We'd go to the corner shop and get our sandwiches at lunchtime, and that was that was the limit of our excitement. And then suddenly you, you're transported to Hollywood, all this preposterous glamour and glitz and expense everywhere. Uh, but it's a lovely feeling, lovely feeling. You know, I, I, I'm a great fan of the Oscars. I really, I like the whole thing. People, some people are rude about it. I'm not. I love it. I love it. It's ridiculous, and I love it. Um, and yeah, and I guess it led on to, you know, more work. I don't, and there weren't very many of us at that time. We were, we were a small group. There's, you know, about eight or something like that. It was, yeah. So we, it, was a, it was a small celebration at the pub, but, but small but enthusiastic, yeah. So you worked on loads of adverts during the 1980s, yeah. including Kodak's re-record Don't Fade Away, which is still oh, yeah. stuck in my head. I haven't, I probably still have some VHS tapes somewhere. I need to test that really. I love the last forever, apparently. Yes, yeah, yeah. 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 be the last thing I do on my deathbed check the <laughs> video. Yeah, otherwise, I'm going to get a refund for that. Sure, not um, so, do you, do you have a favorite that you worked on? There was the Chewitz advert and tons of others. Oh, yeah, there were some good ones, weren't there? Some nice ones. I, I was like, I, I was like the Lurpak character, I like Lurpak. The Lurpak Butterman was very, was very good, you know. <laughs> um, I like. And we did. Oh God, we did. We did one for Hamlet's cigars. We, we, and it's funny, isn't that amazing? Now you could advertise cigars on. TV. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, which was the man, on top of a wedding cake, the, the like the plastic model of a, of a groom, on a wedding cake, and there was no bride, so he was he was he was like. I'm waiting for it to turn up, you know, like he was left at the altar, but on top of the wedding cake. Uh, and eventually he had a Hamlet cigar and he was fine. And <laughs> I also remember him, him walking across to the wedding cake, walking across the top of it, and his feet crunching into the icing like in snow. Very good. Was the, was the cigar made, or was it an actual cigar, or was it plasticine? It was plasticine, but somehow we got some real smoke and mm. put that on, you know, using special effects. Now, in the year 2000, Chicken Run was, of course, released. Yeah. That was Ardman's first feature-length animated film. Yeah. What challenges came along with that? Was it just a case of scaling up the size of the production, or were there lots of unseen things that you hadn't had to deal with before? 
there was a lot, there, it was a complete change, yes, it was, because until that time, I guess the truth is that until that time, we'd been entirely in charge of our own destiny, that, that small group of us, you know, the, um, and by that time, we weren't that small a group, we were, we were perhaps, you know, 30, or something nice, but still, totally in charge of our own destiny, um, and suddenly we, um, you know, we were in partnership with DreamWorks in California. And uh, I say partnership, you know, they never, um, they never owned any part of us. They didn't, you know, so we were always independent. But we kind of had to, we had to learn, we had to learn to play the game their way a bit, you know. Um, not, I would say, in storytelling, no, that, or in animation, that, that was, we did that our own way. But other things, the way, um, the way you make a film, the, 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 the numbers of people involved. We, we'd made, um, the last film we'd made was A Close Shave, which is a in Gromit story. And that's 30 minutes long. And it, the whole team was about 30 people, I think. And so we thought, well, that's easy enough. So uh, if that was 30 minutes, a 90 minute film would just be like three times as big. Yeah. We thought in our in our innocence, and it wasn't. It was like it was like ten times as big. It really, it really, it really was like that. Yes, it was. Um, so the scale of everything was was amazing, uh, and it meant we had to bring in loads of new people quite quickly. You know, and and everything up to that point, we'd always evolved steadily. I think we were very. I think we were very steady people. You know, so we we hadn't gone through like violent. Um, revolutions we evolved from stage to stage and suddenly this was a big big change to bring in so many people new skills um costume designs we'd never we'd never seen a costume designer before oh exciting thank you the old uh, the old family lord family clock there um yeah We'd never, we'd never worked with costumes before. We'd never worked with um, production designers before, uh, and you know, storyboard is very important in animation. Um, and and we'd always done storyboards um, for all our films. And normally, the storyboard would be done by two people who would would one of whom would be the director. And we'd think through the film we wanted to make and then we'd do the storyboard. But suddenly, instead of that, we had eight storyboard artists all working at the same time. And you had to, instead, instead of doing it yourself, you had to empower them to do it um, and uh, all that kind of thing. And uh, oh, um, scale, you know, we had, um, uh, we had chickens and we had humans. And our chickens were. Wait there. Wait there. I'm not going anywhere. I've got a chicken right here. Here's, here's a chicken, actual size. Here's Rocky. So that's how. So that's how big a chicken puppet is, and a human puppet, Mr. Tweedy, would be not much taller. You know, a couple of couple of inches taller. Um, and so so we were operating on at least two scales. Uh, and that was confu that was challenging, uh, and we had and and here's another thing that that is puzzling is that when you make um, an animated movie, you don't just have one Rocky and one Ginger, you have twenty Rockies and twenty Gingers at least. Uh, so so you're in you're into mass production of making them, and then the animators have to. Um, all animate like at the same time so you might on on any given day you might have 15 different animators all making ginger perform wow. and it is a performance and then and then it all had to look like one performance you know even though it was anything but and so there was a whole new way of thinking as well so it was it was full of challenges yeah, that must have been really hard to just coordinate everybody to do the same yeah. thing at the same time. Yeah, and and you're right. Then coordination. I mean that that became 
a whole new job in itself. You know, studio managers, um, assistant directors, you know, a great a complicated hierarchy sprang up and, um, <clears throat> and people with walkie talkies pursuing you all around the building to make sure that you were where you ought to be every, every given time. For the director, it was absolutely exhausting, absolutely exhausting because you had to be sort of, you had to keep an eye on, on, you know, 10 different parts of the story at, every day at, at the same time. And so was would that just be one scene being worked on at one time or were there multiple scenes being developed simultaneously? Yeah, it was multiple scenes, that's right. All, all over, all over the thing, yeah. So you'd be working on, on any one day, you, you might be working on, Six, six completely different scenes. One, you know, from from the start of the film, and one from the very end of the film, and, ev and everywhere in between. Um, yeah. So, it's a, so trying to hold all that in your head. You know, wh where are we now? Uh, yeah. Obviously, there are people to help you. Of course, of course, there are. But it was a, it was um, hard work. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, I can't. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so, is it true that you went to Wensleydale with Nick Park to write the script? Yeah, we did. We did. We did. And we did. That's right. I've forgotten that. We had, we had this um, American writer, a guy called Kerry, Kerry Kirkpatrick, a very nice bloke indeed. And, um, but very American, very American. And so we felt he needed to um, see the real thing. If I had a bottle, if I had a bottle over, I'd drink this beer, which is right here. But I haven't. I'll carry on. Do you want to grab a drink? You're very welcome to. Um, Yes, shall I? Wait, no, please see, absolutely. I'll be back. I've got my Beano mug and my and my bottle of uh, bottle of beer, which I don't I don't always have beer beside me. <laughs> Sometimes you drink it too. <laughs> but we had a um, we had a, a an art man pub quiz the other night, a Zoom pub quiz, and I bought this beer actually as a, as a hilarious joke to, uh, to fill the frame with beer. Um, and now I'm drinking. Where was I? You were in Wensleydale. In Wensleydale, thank you. Yeah, Wednesday, yeah, that's right. Um, so Kerry, this writer, um, yeah, he, he, we needed him to get the place a bit, you know. And but I think, no, I can't believe it. I think it was almost chance in Wednesday, and yet that seems unlikely now. We we wanted to be in Yorkshire. We and uh, anyway, we chose a country pub anyway, country pub, country hotel, for uh, just a long weekend, I think. And the idea was that we would walk around by day, you know, taking in the the moors and stuff like that, and the atmosphere, and then go to pubs at night and talk and talk and talk and just talk about the story the whole time. That was the, the idea. But then as it was Wednesday day, we had to go to the, the creamery, the Hawes Creamery, where they make Wednesday day, uh, where Nick was treated as a, as a god. Uh, carried him shoulder high and through the streets because, because they always said, I was always told that, that um, the Wednesday day creamery was sort of on its, knees a bit the, the business was fading uh when um Wallace came along promoting <laughs> promoting <laughs> promoting Wednesday yeah he must have said it twice didn't he he must have said it in um he said it in a grand day out and he said it again in in a close shave Wednesday Dale. They must all be huddled around their TVs every time there's a new episode of Wallace and Gromit, hoping he'll mention it again. Yes, you're right. We should definitely get some more in, shouldn't we? Yeah. <laughs> For, uh, yes. I don't know if it features... No, in, in, um, uh, in the Were Rabbit, there's some other cheese called Stinking Bishop, which, which, was, which was indeed a very extraordinarily smelly cheese. That, that, uh, that was, in that case, it was used to, to bring... Um, Bring Wallace back from the dead, which is quite uh, you know, quite a claim. Very useful. <laughs> now, of course, when you started working with DreamWorks, you were invited out for dinner with Jeffrey Katzenberg and Steven Spielberg. What was that like? Yeah, that was pretty good. That was good. Yeah, that was funny. That 
but when I look back at it now, I can see, I can see with hindsight, it was a, it was a brilliant scheme to draw us in actually, because, um, because we, we were looking, we were looking to get into the movie business. And we had this idea, this chicken run idea, and we kind of, well, well, let's also say that Nick had these three Oscars, which kind of helped. And um, we, we, we went round Hollywood to all the different studios um, looking for partner, looking for partner, really. And um, so we went to, you know, uh, Fox and Warner Brothers and maybe Columbia. I can't remember where we were at Paramount, all these, these big studios. And it was all very nice. And everyone, everyone was pleased to see us and, and quite interested in working with us. And there was this new studio just started, which was DreamWorks. And um, so we met Steven Spielberg at dinner one night where we pitched the... Um, Pitch the idea, the, the uh, chicken run idea, and I have to say, yes, you know, it's, it's it's quite it's amazing. Uh, I Hollywood fascinates me, and yet it horrifies me as well. And it's it's very very unlike, it's very unlike us, you know. Mm. But but it's amazing that that's a world that we can operate in and play in. It's very surprising and good, and um, and one of the things. Uh, that happens in Hollywood is if, when you've got a great idea, you pitch it to people. You know, and, um, you know you've heard the expression "the elevator pitch." That's when you that's when you literally lift someone and you've got thirty seconds to tell them that your idea. Uh, there's that, uh, and or, or or more, you know, ideally you're invited to a meeting and you deliver your pitch. Uh, and so we delivered our pitch for um, Chicken Run. Which was, which was, we're going to do the Great Escape with chickens, and I do still think that is pretty well the perfect Hollywood pitch. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't get much better than that <laughs> because it um, because it's magic. I think it's magic because the Great Escape um, is not very, probably not so well known now. I expect, but um, probably not. But very but very well known to our generation. Uh, um, a very well remembered, much admired film, um, and all about um, male heroics. And how funny to to take that and replace it with a bunch of female chickens being being heroic. And uh, and for the, you know. The uh, visual language is like perfect, like like the, the the prison camp in The Great Escape looks very much like an enormous chicken farm. It really does. So it's kind of perfect, and and then chickens are funny because everyone knows they're cowards. That the the name is you know synonymous with being a coward, and then everyone thinks they're stupid. So making them making them brilliant and brainy and and heroic was a great thing. Am I right in understanding that Mel Gibson recorded his lines in America? And if so, was that more difficult to direct? Yes, Mel. Well, Mel. Mel. My old mate, Mel. <laughs> um, he uh, he oh, was yeah. always in America, yeah. <laughs> um, but the first time we went out to, to record with him, he went to Canada. It was, a, it was on a, it was a technicality, something to do with the um, Screen Actors Guild, I think. That oh, there it's called. Um, that uh, so he recorded. Anyway, he went. We went to Vancouver. So we flew to Vancouver, and we took with us Julia Sawala, who was ginger, and recorded them both uh, in in um, yeah in Vancouver. And it, and that was good. I mean, it, it, Nick and I were very new to this game because you know making an animated film is one thing, but but. Directing actors is quite a different skill. I mean, it's a th really different. And um, which none of us knew, you know, we haven't, um, 
we weren't trained in that. We'd never worked with actors before. And suddenly they, oh God, now we're, now we're, now we're telling Mel Gibson what to do. But <laughs> of course, um, you don't, ideally, you don't tell them what to do. This is, that's not what directors do. You know, direct, you know, directors have to kind of, you know, I was going to say manipulate, but that sounds too devious. But you, you've got to find ways to get, to get actors to, to, you know, to be, to be themselves and do what they want to do. And it's what you want as well. It's, it's, it's quite an art anyway. Um, and I think Bell was very patient actually, really, given that the two absolute nitwits were trying to direct him, you know, um, and that was the main one. And then, so that was face to face. Uh, and then later, after that first trip, we didn't then need to do any more face to face. So after that, um, we would do it down the, down the line with him in him in California and us in Bristol, which I hated. I didn't like that because when you can't see them, there was none of, none of this, none of this zoom. You couldn't see, you couldn't see him. So you, so it's, it's, you know you just don't know how it's going. You can't tell. And, and what and once you got quite pissed off with this, uh, I can't remember why. I think we were, I think because we were being too hesitant, and he and he he walked out. But I don't I. I don't blame him. I think we, were, <laughs> you know, we weren't very good at our job at that time. I suppose the actors that you're used to working with, you had so much control over them. You, you know, move them one finger at a time and stuff. Exactly, exactly. It's so funny. It's, it's so different. You know, we're we're used. To, we're the ultimate control freaks, aren't we? You know, that that the, the actor does exactly what you want in every respect. You know, and now, but in, with these guys, they. It doesn't work that way. I discover. I discover. <laughs> just yeah. Just say, make that syllable a bit longer, Mel, and then just you know, skip through that next syllable. No, doesn't work. Have you got a, a favourite scene from Chicken Run that sort of was the most fun to work on or, or to watch back? I lo I love the, the escape at the end. I mean, it's a big, it's a big scene, but it's you know like um. What they call what they call the third act, you know, and, you know, things things have gone very badly for, for your heroes. Yeah, they're in a terrible state, uh, and it looks like they're doomed, and everyone's and Ginger's hopes are dashed. And then it turns round, and she, you know, she has a new idea. I'll make this aeroplane to fly away in, um, and so so the whole business that well, that whole business really of of you know. Build, building the airplane, getting ready, ready for takeoff, attacking Mr. Tweedy and tying him up and sticking him under a hut, um, and then the big, the big attempt to actually take off, uh, all that stuff. I love, I love all that. It's wonderful. And when I remember, always remember seeing it, I can't remember where it was. It was somewhere with a very friendly audience, you know, uh, and the audience just cheered when the plane finally took off. You know, it was spontaneously cheered. And that was, which, so I love that scene. Yeah, I, I saw that from so many times because at the time I was studying animation at university and it was at the cinema. So I would, you know, go in three periods right. and go watch it again. And Now, rumour has it that there, there might be a chicken one too. Is there anything that you can good. tell us about that? Yeah, it's true. It is official now. Um, now, I probably don't, I don't, know what I can, I don't know what's official though. Um, I know we're doing you say, I suppose. <laughs> you heard it from me first. So I know we're doing well. We are. We've been working on it for quite a long time. I mean, it's 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 amazing how long films take. Terrifying how long films take. Um, and we had a we had a great idea, and we started to we started to storyboard it, uh, and then um, and then we realised there was a fault. There was a flaw in our great idea. So we had to whoa stop and have a bit of a rethink which is quite common in our business um but this very month in a couple of days time end of this end of this month anyway i'll be seeing the first sketch of it um i know it's got most of the same characters in you know because it's the same it's a, it's a sort of a sequel it's it's um yeah, some some years into the future, I don't know, I don't know what else is is officially out there. I'm it's sorry. all officially out there, so it's it's okay to say all of it. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Let me tell you, I'll tell you exactly what happens, beat for beat. Uh, no, yeah, no, 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 nobody, nobody knows what happens. Um, it's a new character. It's a new character. Are, are there returning characters? I'll rephrase that. Are there returning voice characters? I Now that, I don't know. That, I do not know. It's not, let's say it's not cast, which is not cast at all. No one's cast, so I don't know. I don't know about that one. It's resounding, I don't know. Uh, it's not, uh, it's being directed by a guy called Sam Fell. Sam worked with me many times, uh, and then he went and directed a film called Paranorman that was done by Leica. Uh, and he's oh, because he directed Flushed Away for Armin as well. So, so he, he's directing, um, and I know that. Um, we had a practical problem because um, we had that big fire in our warehouse some years ago. I don't know how long ago that was. And all the chickens were consumed in the flames. So, so we, had, we had hundreds of chickens. Well, yeah, I think we had hundreds of chickens. Uh, and but Will all, they be covered in breadcrumbs now? Will it be the same would, chickens where they're cooked? They would be. They would be. And they would be overdone, I would say, <laughs> chronically overdone. Yeah, um, yes. They they were cooked to they were cooked to a vapor. I mean, there's not, nothing left at all. It was, a, it was a hell of a fire, and um, and there were lots of molds as well. Like um, let's talk about more being made in the mold, but the chicken is made in like, a simple a simple chicken like this one here. That I have it in my hand. There, there will probably be thirty or forty different molds to make all the different parts of him, um, and they were all lost as well. So all, all the chickens, all their skeletons, and all the molds to make them were all destroyed. That's rather a shame. It was bad, it was bad luck. Yeah, I remember that. It was it was round about the time that I think Curse the Were Rabbit was number one in the US and I remember yeah it was horrible because I remember seeing the footage of this uh, warehouse burning down with all that old stuff in it but yeah yeah because, because you have some of the the uh, the models still are you able to work off them to sort of recreate them at least in terms of scale yes we yeah but there was amazingly little that was left but yeah we have we've done it now I mean, we've, we've rebuilt we've rebuilt Rocky and Ginger and Babs and Fowler I think. So we're working through the whole cast, slowly, yeah. Do you know when that's going to sort of go into actual filming production and when we might see it? I imagine it'll be a few years, obviously, yeah, yeah. but... Where are we now? We're 20 now, so... I guess it'll be ready in 23... 2023, I guess, I think. If all goes well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As long as there's no new pandemics or anything, it should be yeah, fine. Yes. <laughs> yes, if we just keep, if we keep, can we keep the pandemics to a minimum from now on, that would help enormously, yeah. <laughs> That's my motto. <laughs> and so, then after that, Ardman worked on Flushed Away. It was somewhat of a departure in that it was digital, it was CG yeah. animation, but it also wasn't because anyone that knows it is, it's still a form of puppetry, isn't it? It's just on a computer rather than models. Was it a big decision for you to sort of go into the digital realm? Well, it was, yeah, it was, absolutely. Because, um, um, because we don't have that big a setup in Bristol. Yeah, because um, it's a whole other pipeline, as to use, use their words, you know, that's the word that they use in the business. Quite literally, you were flushed away, it was. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Quite right. Quite right. Yeah, true. Sure. We should have made a joke of that. But uh, <laughs> it, was, it was, yeah, so a whole new way of working, different skills were involved. But you're right to say it, that the, the fundamentals are the same. Yeah, you've got these, these three-dimensional puppets that you, that you manipulate in the, in the computer, uh, and it's all about performance, you know. That's what that's what people care about. Um, and you build sets, you build sets, you build models. It's except it's all done with people on keyboards rather than people working with their hands. Uh, but we didn't have that, and we still don't have that bigger setup in Bristol because that's a that's a 
whole bloody factory there of people. Which, so therefore, we had to make it somewhere else. So we made it at DreamWorks in California. So um, therefore, in fact, we lost a certain amount of um, control as a result of that. But, uh, but um, I'm, you know, I, I do like the film very much. It's, I, I love, um, I love the... <laughs> I was thinking just the other day, we've got um, uh, a ridiculous frog uh, who's a frog henchman who's called Le Frog, rather brilliantly. Um, and it was um, Jean Reno who did the voice. And, uh, and it was, you know, and it was kind of, it, it was kind of a pantomime Frenchman. You know, like, um, there's a strange, there's a strange, um, trend in British comedy to have fun, laugh at French people, which, which I totally disapprove. But anyway, there, there was a bit, little bit of that involved. And so I had to go to Jean Reno, and I remember that, there was a great line when somebody says, somebody's been tormented. He says, he says, do you find my pain funny? And the frog says, huh, I find everyone's pain funny, but my own. I'm French, and I had to get you know, Jean Renault to do that. But he was uh, he was fine. He was fine about it. He didn't, he didn't complain. And then and then and then Jean Renault as the frog playing against Sir Ian McKellen as the toad. It was it was quite quite spectacular. And he was he was great to work with. He was an extraordinary character to work with. Now, 2012, you released Poets and Adventure with Scientists, which I think was based on the books of Gideon Defoe. Yeah. What, what first attracted you to them? I just read the, I read the book. Someone had, um, someone had brought it in. You know, some, someone had seen it, I don't know who, and thought, that might make a good movie, and brought it in. And, and um, we ha have a meeting every six months or something, and in that meeting, there would be uh, scripts, maybe a comic book, um, and various books that, that, that someone had acquired. Had, that either they'd acquired the rights, or they knew you could acquire the rights, or they just read the book and thought this would be fun. So in that spirit, we were in a meeting. This book was on the table, uh, and I picked it up and started to read it. And, and it immediately thought, wow, this is really special. This is amazing. The comic tone just hugely appealed to me. Now, it's as simple as that, you know. Um, it's quite, quite, it's both silly and, in a, it's silly in an adult way, I think, you know, like it's, it's fundamentally incredibly smart, but on the surface, extremely stupid and, and foolish and ridiculous. Um, and I, I loved it. I loved it. I just loved the tone of it, and and wanted to make a film that was for a slightly older audience. Because there's some one of the things which is difficult in the in the animation business is that um, it's kind of it's sort of understood that it's for children, um, even if it's not. Uh, and as a filmmaker, I mean. I, <laughs> well, certainly with both Chicken Run, with Chicken Run, and again with um, the Pirates, and with Wallace and Gromit, uh, there come a time, quite late on, when you do a test screening to see what uh, a test audience thinks, and then go somewhere, either Long Beach in California, or Basingstoke, or somewhere like that, and... Um, uh, a bunch of people turn up to watch it and give comments. And, and you're there um, as the filmmaker and you suddenly see these people, these ordinary people, and you think, oh shit, this is, this is the audience. I didn't, I've forgotten that. I've forgotten that they, they were, you know, because you make it for yourself, really, I think. You, know, you, just, you do what amuses you and, you and you keep working at it until it's right. And, uh, and then suddenly, oh gosh, here's, here's, here's ordinary people. What? And then they and then they just start bringing four year olds and you think what this is this is not for four year olds you know we're, but because it's animation it kind of is so and the best film the the most successful films uh, are financially successful like um like um a Toy Story film you know is brilliant because it it, it brilliantly 
bridges the gap. It's got, it's got plenty for a three-year-old to, to enjoy and plenty for their parents to enjoy as well. So anyway, so we tried to do that with um, pirates. So, you know, it was a different, a different tone to, to the average um, movie. Absolutely. And one thing I loved about it were the incredible intricate sets. Like there's one, I think, set in a theatre that looks enormous. How big were they? Yeah, that was that was a lovely set. Yeah, it was great. It was, and that set was. I'm looking around the room now. It's um, it was probably about, it was probably eighteen feet by twelve feet or something like that. Quite maybe maybe bigger. <laughs> what I remember best was unusually, unusually, it was a set which existed with four walls. You know, most sets in films and stuff like that um, don't have four walls or in animation anyway they don't have four walls most of the time because you got to put the camera somewhere and, and, and the lights and stuff like that with a live action movie cameras are so small now and lights are so small you can shoot inside a small room very easily but in our world it's still rather difficult so normally we have only three walls this theatre had four walls and it had, it had um, quite a lot of characters into it. And the animator could get into it through a hole in the floor and could pop up uh, in what might be the orchestra pit in a traditional theatre and animate from there. And uh, one day we had a visit from um, Brian Blessed, who was playing the Pirate King. And Brian Blessed it was a great sport. And he very gallantly jammed himself into the, in the middle of the set more it's such a giant of a man he more or less lifted the whole thing up on his shoulders he was so a, a so huge and b so strong he, he climbed and lifted lifted the entire set up and it was quite alarming to see him in there um yes but that yeah lo, lo, I mean, lovely sets the uh the pirate galleon has been touring the world ever since going to uh, exhibitions I think oh, it, it has been in, in the Korea now, somewhat locked down, and is shortly going to uh, the, Netherl the Netherlands, I believe. So that'd be nice. Oh, wow. So everyone should look out for that. Yeah. And the pirate ship was a fantastic thing. Yeah. There's, there's so many scenes in that film that just demand re-watching, and there's so many details in the background that are just amazing and rich and you know you can watch it hundreds of times have you got yeah. any favorites I, I do love that film what's a favorite uh -huh. <laughs> i just love the, i love the tone of the whole thing um I mean, I'm, I'm very attached to the, the scenes in the the royal society which is kind of ridiculous because um that's not <laughs> It's one of the jokes of the film because the, the guy, Gideon, is a, is a very playful fellow. Very playful. Um, quite miserable, um, and, but playful. Nice combination. And, um, and so the fact that you would take the Royal Society, which is like, for kids in particular, it's not, it's not sexy. Like, who cares about the Royal you know, what, what kids has ever heard of all care about the Royal Society. So it's a strange place to take as a, as a major setting. And then play... Um, so the Royal Society is this, is this um, society of distinguished scientists um, who discuss, you know, the greatest scientific discoveries of their age. Uh, and that's what... And it's, so it, our Royal Society is full of pompous gentlemen with handlebar moustaches and formal formal attire and the pirate captain comes on and he does a kind of a, a, a absurdist um showbiz presentation jumping around the stage uh utterly utterly out of out of anachronistic utterly anachronistic nothing at all to do with the period or the place uh and, but but he's so good that the scientists totally love him at the end of all you know so, so it's i, I I love the mischief of it. <laughs> in the original book, it was even more mischievous. I, 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 there was a ridiculous scene. I can't, 
where for some reason the pirate captain disguised himself as the Holy Ghost, I think, and had a fight with um, with the Bishop of Oxford or something like this. Uh, I mean, that, that's some, some absolutely insane, insane scene. Um, not, not the stuff of the average kid's animated movie. But actually, I mean, obviously that idea didn't make it through. I think we thought that was too bad. But um, <laughs> uh, Gideon was a very, very funny... He wrote a very funny book and then he wrote a very funny script. He was very creative guy. I've always wondered and looked at maps differently having seen the one in Pirates because, of course, there's a sea monster in the corner which turns out to be real. So now I just imagine what else could come to life in these maps. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was, um, that was like a a classic, I would say, you know, like a classic. The the idea of a map with a little dotted line moving across it and then things moving was was a classic a classic one you know that that i would associate with swashbuckling tales from my, my youth i think but then then the fact that the pirate captain the fact that the captain himself who's astonishingly stupid man and uh, has no idea that the that, that, that seamoss is just there for decoration as he as he thinks you know. and it needs needs charles darwin to explain it to him and then in 2011, Arthur Christmas came out and Ardman collaborated with Sony Pictures Animation. What were they yeah. like to work with? Um, extraordinary. And they, um, we had the same sort of thing as we had with DreamWorks. It was made somewhere else. And that's just that, that slight loss of control when you've got other, you know, you're working with, in, that, in this case, a big studio in um, Culver City in Los Angeles. Uh, with hundreds of highly paid people um, and they're making it and they're making it for us so let's, let's be clear but you you end up running into their sort of internal politics you know and in their their internal budgeting and that kind of thing so it's it's, it's that you lose a little bit of control which is which is exasperating but they did an amazing job they technically they were superb you know they were st- because that technology, that computer animation technology, is changing the whole time, um, and you, and they had some uh, most amazing um, tools available. To, there, there were there were ways you could. And actually, it's now it's quite common now. It was like a bit like virtual reality that you could you could build a set and then go into it apparently with a with like with a live camera and look around even though when i say build a set it's just it's just a it's just stuff in the computer you know there was nothing real not a real set like we know but um just a computer set and you could go into it and look around and move around move the camera choose where to put the camera and that kind of thing amazing technologies my understanding is that early man was kind of in development for quite a while i think it was first mentioned in about 2007 or hinted at really um it doesn't yeah, it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, you're right, it was. God, it's so slow. Our business is so slow. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, it doesn't have to be, but it always is. You know, um, yeah, 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 it was. That. So that, yeah, you're right, it was. Because Nick had the, he had the idea, but no script for a long time and I think maybe I mean was he distracted was he doing something else maybe he I can't remember the order of events maybe he started Early Man and then filmed um, A Matter of Loath and Death maybe I can't remember but that sort of thing so yeah they're, they're, but the bottom line is there is a tendency for these projects to be around for a very 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 long time um, I will say defensively that it seems to be the same all around the world. That, like, um, from our from experience, our experience at, at DreamWorks, at Pixar, at Disney, they all it's a slow all game, you know. Uh, and often, often they they sit around and just stew on a very, a very low um, simmer for for a long time. Maybe, maybe. Some say you turn the gas right off and put it to one side, and then you know, back, and then bring it forward again, warm it up again, um, until 
some magic thing falls into place and you're ready to go. And then, and then, when, and then when you're ready to go, then you're in real trouble because then there's never enough time. Having, <laughs> having waited five years, then you find yourself in an ungodly rush for the next three years. I suppose the, the thing is that, of course, you're, you're not a factory just churning out products. You're, you're craftsmen and artists and filmmakers and you're making things that you love and that you have in your hands literally every day. Yeah. You yeah. want them to be perfect and by the time they are released, they are. You know, not just once, but every single release is amazing. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. on decades later. So I think that's what makes the difference because they're created yeah. with love rather than with like just panic to create them. Yes, thank you. It's interesting, actually, when you say it, because, I, I mean, you're right, absolutely right. And I never quite, I suppose it's probably occurred to me before, but you've made me think, oh, yeah, it's true, very true what you say. It's actually, um, it's both at the same time. You're right, because it's, it's made with that great love and, and um, um, you know, attention, attention to detail and love of the material and love of doing it right and respect for the audience and all those things. Um, and, but it, but the uh, mechanics of it and the, the financing of it is, is like a big business, you know, and you, so you have to, you have to combine the two. Um, and the direct, director's job is to drive the, uh, the um, accountants crazy. You know, that's, that's the way it goes. The Simpsons, Matt Groening, yeah. a big fan of Aardman. And yeah. I think I remember seeing him at the, is it called the Watershed in Bristol? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a, an, an Aardman spoof on The Simpsons once. There Did wasn't. he have anything to do with that? No, he didn't, sadly. I wish, it, I wish they'd asked. Yeah, no, I, I know the woman who did it, actually. Yeah, yeah. But they, they didn't ask. I don't, no, I mean, I don't, I, don't mean, I don't mean they didn't ask for authority. I don't care about that, but they didn't. Didn't let us have a go at doing it because it would have been a great thing to do. <laughs> I suppose it's not a spoof of you spoof yourself, though, is it? No. Well, we could do them. <laughs> we could do. <laughs> in 1988, Hugh framed Roger Rabbit came out, which in the mid 80s saw Disney and Warner Brothers characters on the screen at the same time, and yep. I think there was Betty Boop and lots of other characters. If there were like a, a modern day version of that, which universes would you love to see your characters interact with outside 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 our outside, universe. outside yeah where would i like to go <laughs> i don't know i'd quite like <laughs> i'd quite like to go to the uh, the universe of trolls have you seen the that movie yeah and yeah the new one i love it yeah yeah i'd like to go there that'd be <laughs> that'd be good that'd be good yes so you're leaning towards a musical uh, yes i would like to do a musical yeah Yes, very, actually very much. Yeah, I mean, God knows how. God knows how our characters fit in anywhere else. You know. Yes, but they're so sort of um, particular to us. I think. But, uh, <laughs> it's t turned into a pitching session now. Back. Yeah. <laughs> Last summer, I went on holiday to Cornwall, and I went to the the Grand Experience. It was a lot of fun. How did that come about? Having a sort of physical face of people who don't interact with and sit in recreations of the set. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. To be honest, I have no idea how that came about. I do know that we now uh, employ a woman, a very, very smart woman, uh, and her, her job is um, things like that, like exhibitions, exhibitions, visitor attractions, as they're called, theme park rides. That, we don't do much, but that, that's... But that's becoming a business for us more and more. Yeah. So there's um yeah, there's that one in Cornwall. There's there's something in the Gold Coast in Australia. There's something in Sweden. Quite a lot in Japan. Big fans in Japan. Mossy Bottom Farm has been built in built in Japan. Really quite convincingly actually. Uh, but 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 convincingly, you know, it's a very faithful recreation of the miniature set full size really really faithful but it looks a bit weird sitting in the japanese countryside <laughs> you've been awarded a cbe have you ever been tempted to command the british empire to do anything no um I, it's not i haven't been called upon but i'm ready you know uh, yeah you know, if 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 there's any if any part of it needs commanding i'm your man absolutely you know you know i'm poised just waiting for my moment come on it's such a great title
I mean, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. And you, if there's any trouble on, in the Empire, wherever that would be, rock all, then I'm, you know, I'm your man. <laughs> I feel, looking back to the first days of war, would you say that your creative process has changed very much? Obviously, there's bigger productions and perhaps increased ambition on the projects, but is the you know the actual animation is it still very much similar to what you did in the early days? Yeah, I think it is. I think I think I think it's much more the same than it is different. Uh, yeah, I mean, technically, it's all changed. Um, to put it mildly, um, the animation is the same, but. But the cameras and the capturing is all different. Um, but I think the thinking is basically the same. Yeah. Uh, the same and I hope uh, also different, which is because, you know, because the heart of the business is, is ideas and, um, and ideas should come from different people, you know. They should do it. I mean, they, they, they do anyway. Um, um, but we should be on the lookout for new, new talent the whole time. We are, and it's and it's difficult. You know, it's difficult to find them. And when you found them, it's difficult to place them with a project. But that, that's the, that's the future. You know, and I, I I don't mind at all, not at all, that in ten years' time. The work would look quite really quite different. That doesn't worry me at all, as long as it's got the same kind of spirit. Yeah, because that's the thing. Everything that you've worked on, be it stop motion animation or CG or anything like that, you can tell it's an Armand production, and I love that. It's got the same sense of humour and sensibilities and artistic style. Yeah, carried across yeah. every project. Mm. Thank you. Yeah. Have you got any advice for anyone student or anyone that wants to get into animation? I mean, I suppose it's obvious, it's obvious to say that there's there's two things. There's being there's being a, a craftsperson, and then there's being a a creator. You've got to be so careful with words, haven't you? I mean, a craftsperson, a craftsperson is creative, absolutely. But I mean, the person that generates the idea is what I mean. So, yeah, and and I, I, I just say it because it, the two ideas are often very confused with students, understandably. So, so a student comes out of, you know, a student graduates, um, and what are they going to do? Are they going, are they going to are they going to direct direct films and you know direct short films and direct commercials and and one day direct a movie? Is that what they're going to do, or are they going to be a an animator or a story artist or a puppet maker or a renderer you know all these different uh, jobs are out there for for all those all those craft jobs which I, I love you know I mean I, you know let's talk about animation because animation is not it's, it's a it's a craft you know but but it's a craft of great complexity and subtlety. So I'm looking for people that can um, take a character, take a performance, take take a scene and make it brilliant. You know, that's what I want. And, I, and they don't, that person doesn't need to be any, doesn't need to be a storyteller or doesn't need to be a writer, doesn't need to be a, you know, a great director. They just need to be a great animator. And so I'd be very, I'm very happy if, people that young people um just really concentrate on, on being great animators performing brilliantly but but if they're not working on a funny interesting project it's kind of hard to show yourself off you know um so um you know the the the, the director who had a great idea who executed it brilliantly well and, and perhaps you know made perhaps did the storyboard as well perhaps made the puppets perhaps perhaps did the animation that person is incredibly valuable but that is a rare that's a rare gift um so don't so i look we're looking for those people i'm looking for that director that has the 
the idea, the vision, the amazing vision. That's great. But I'm also looking for the person that can take somebody else's vision and and do it brilliantly well. And for those people, I just say, just keep keep practicing. You know, keep doing as much as you can with performance. Um, and uh, the the other thing, it, I say performance and for animators, and like it's a really valuable thing. Yes, but a personality comes into it as well. Personal. You know, like so, there's another thing, there's an interesting thing. So if you're an animator and you're working with a director, um, then you need to be a certain w- way of thinking is, is really important, you know, to um, uh, recept- receptive, you know, flexible, um, easy to work with, you know, um, always giving more than they're asked for, all these, all those kind of things, but those personality things, they, they count for a lot as well. The thing I've always loved about animation is there's so many aspects to it. There's the, the acting aspect, as you say, bringing the characters to life, and there's just understanding how the universe works, gravity and muscle yes. movement and stuff like that. And yeah. even something as simple as a walk cycle, by changing a certain thing, how they hold their body or how they walk and all that kind of thing, you can convey so much about a character before they've yeah. even said a word. Yeah, yes, yes, it's really, it's, yeah, it's really, there's so much to it, isn't there? You're right. And, and they, they, they are, to me, absolutely, they're, they're like actors is what they are most like. You know? They're like actors, yeah, they're actors, but, but they're also required to be this very difficult thing of acting like somebody else. As well, you know, like like as I was saying, twenty people animating Ginger, but all looking like one performance. What can you tell us about Robin? Robin, the new animated yeah. special coming to Netflix. Yeah, good. Christmas, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yes, it was designed for Christmas this year, but thanks to this little unpleasantness with the coronavirus, it might now be bumped to to be released next year. Not sure yet, but that's quite likely. Um, Mikey, please, and Dan Ojari, I think he's called. Check, check spelling. Um, are directing, uh, and they and um, uh, they're amazing. They're very, very extremely um, uh, hardworking and um, uh, exacting kind of directors you know they've, they've got a vision which, which they're determined to get right um and so it's christmas a christmas story christmas story uh it's got music it's got songs very lovely very lovely songs um and the the look yeah, the characters are felted that the uh the fashionable felted look which has provided us with, with a whole host of new challenges, which has been good. <laughs> Keeping the fluff off of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So they, they're still boiling. <laughs> boiling. <laughs> You'd one of those things you roll over them with the sellotape yeah. or something. Yeah. I think we've got those, yeah. Yeah, it does, it does require a whole different set of skills, yeah. And the, the funny thing is, the you know, there's a, there's a felting needle that people use. I've never done it, but but you you manipulate felt with a with a, a barbed needle, and so the an, the animators are using these barbed needles actually to animate with, not 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 for the main body image, but for some of the, for some of the finer facial details. That animate yeah, extraordinary. I'm very much looking forward to seeing and hearing more about the film when it comes out. Yes, looking beautiful. But what else are you working on at the moment? What's keeping you occupied? What what projects are you on at the minute? So at the moment, there's the, the, the big ones: Robin, Robin, which is meant, to, which should be, which is in production, except we have to, except we're locked down. Um, a series of more f- five-minute stories for Sky, for Sky Kids. Uh, we've sh- we've finished four. We've got another ten or so to go. Um, and oh, Chicken Run too, because that's the pretty, pretty huge one, and that's and that is being uh, we're doing the story reel now, and um, I should be seeing that at the end of the week, uh, end, end of the month. So, 
Amazing. And finally, have you got any messages for people watching the Sarah O'Connell show and your fans around the world? <laughs> well, um, I, I, this is just, just that, um, just that, that, that animation continues to be, you know, a hugely satisfying activity for us. We get enormous pleasure from doing it, enormous pleasure from telling stories, sharing stories. It's a very inclusive medium. It just always has been. I mean, that's, that's why, you know, so many massively successful films from Pixar and Ghibli, why do they, why do they travel so well? Because it's such an inclusive kind of medium. Um, it's a great, it's a great world to play in, a great world. Um, it's exciting. Some people, you know, the, Civilians are inclined to say, "Wow, you must be so patient. Gosh, it's so slow. Uh, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem slow. It's quite frenetic. It's busy. It's active. It's dynamic." And um, and the other thing is that um, what is very thrilling about it now is it's so like democratic because anyone can do it at home. I mean, not, not anyone, but. Um, if you can afford or have access to a phone or a laptop, you can you can do your own animation. That's a wonderful thing. That's amazing. When we started, it was an extremely unusual thing to do. Nobody else was doing it, and now, like everyone could do it. And and I see the results. That, you know, young people sending in to me their work, and I'm constantly amazed and impressed by the quality that's out there. Well, Peter Lord, thank you so much for that. You're a legendary filmmaker and it's an honour to have you on my show today. Great. My pleasure, Sarah. My pleasure. Thank you very much. So I've been choking my way through it. <laughs> That's okay. And thank you to everybody watching at home. Be sure to share, subscribe, give this video a big thumbs up and leave lots of lovely comments. And I'll see you all again soon for another episode of the Sarah O'Connell Show. Bye. Bye-bye. See ya.